Remember the days before the internet? When, if you wanted to stay awake past midnight, you'd have to either pop in a VHS or see what was on TV. There always was something strange, almost eerie, about this experience. Sitting alone in front of the TV, only the monochromatic glow of the light, with nothing but the sounds of static accompanying you, paired with quiet or muffled audio, and generally terrible production quality. Now imagine if what you saw on TV was never aired again. Imagine hundreds, maybe thousands of people scouring the dark corners of the internet just to archive these films, hoping to find just a trace of their existence. What if they were never found? Maybe it's best that they stay buried. With that being said, let's start the video. Children of Loneliness, 1937. This film is one of the first of the exploitation genre. And honestly, I wish I could see this film firsthand, because the story behind this movie is both disturbing and fascinating at the same time. Out of the norm for the 30s director Richard C. Kahn's, Children of Loneliness explores the subject of homosexuality. However, it's not really known whether or not it was meant to educate the public or exploit this at the time new type of person, or third sex as it was called at the time. It only was shown in a few locations around the United States such as Los Angeles or Washington DC, said to be loosely inspired by the novel Well of Loneliness, 1928, and filmed in 1937. The basic plot involves a spiteful lesbian who has a strange obsession with her roommate there's also a corresponding story that involves a young woman who falls in love with a homosexual male artist. The gay characters in this film don't really do so well. For example, the artist commits suicide after being told that he could have a normal marriage. And the lesbian in the film literally gets acid in her eyes which results to her running into oncoming traffic and then getting hit by a car. The film itself begun and ended with an on-screen director warning the audience members about the dangers of perversion. This was also more likely a precaution taken by the directors to avoid being arrested, as addressing homosexuality in movies was illegal in the United States at the time. The story does not end there, because according to some sources, doctors would regularly come into the movie theater after these showings and distribute pamphlets on how to cure the gay away. Obviously, the film was meant to portray homosexuality as some sort of disease, and at the time, it actually was considered a disease. It is unknown on how the LGBT community reacted to this, and to this day, all that remains is a few posters made for the film, which to me is still not only homophobic, but a tad creepy as well. Go and get it. 1920. Go and get it is a 1920 lost silent adventure horror comedy directed by Marshall Nealon and Henry Simmons that had one of the most ridiculous plots ever. A newspaper owner partners with a reporter after she suspects her publisher of taking bribes and working with a rival newspaper all while a mad scientist sticks the brain of a presumed serial killer into a gorilla who then goes on a murderous rampage. Despite many positive reviews, with even a special mention to the gorilla character played by former boxer Bull Montana, Go and Get It is now lost. No known copies of this film have survived, however there are still posters and production photographs available to look at as well as a 1941 remake under the name The Monster and the Girl. Batman Dracula, 1964 In 1964, a black and white American film starring underground actor Jack Smith was produced about the DC character Batman. 
Not to be confused with the 1967 film Batman Fights Dracula, this movie was made without DC's permission and was only shown at exclusive private screenings held by artist Andy Warhol and once at Warhol's art exhibit, Warhol being the producer and director of the film. Mostly famous for being a key figure in American pop art movements, Warhol was also known for making his own artistic progressive films, some of which have gained a cult following, Batman Dracula being a perfect example. Since Warhol's death, the film has been considered lost, and only a number of movie clips were shown in the 2006 documentary Jack Smith and the Destruction of Atlantis. Batman Dracula was primarily filmed on the beaches of Long Island, New York, as well as random Manhattan rooftops, and Warhol's personal art studio known as The Factory. Batman Dracula has also been noted to perhaps be one of the first films in history to feature the camp aesthetic showing an extremely campy Batman, unlike the stereotypical, dark, stoic Batman we all know and love today. Amazingly enough, this movie may perhaps be another first in film history, that being the first semi-live-action Batman film. You can barely tell what's going on since the plot is unclear and it's hard to see the actors' faces, not to mention the movie is just confusing in general. Watching it makes you feel as if you're in some kind of weird, messed up dream with out-of-place songs and mood music spastic flashes of white light and translucent overlays of random people's faces. I can only imagine that this movie is what it must look like during a trip, without color of course. Greed, the full 8 hour cut, 1924. Greed is another American silent film made in 1924 and directed by Erich von Stroheim. It tells the story of John and Trina, an engaged couple who the latter of which wins the lottery, their prize being $5,000, which at the time was a very substantial amount. Their luck is cut short when their jealous friend informs the authorities that John has been practicing dentistry without a license and the couple is left with no money. Despite having nothing, Trina becomes insanely obsessed with her winnings, refuses to spend any of it. Equally, her husband murders her for the money and runs away from the authorities. However, there is more to this movie than meets the eye. It is said that Stroheim had over 85 hours of footage for Greed, and like his characters, he had an obsession, which was with the accuracy during filming. Two months was spent just filming the final scene, and many of the cast and crew fell ill due to the exhaustion of filming in the midsummer heat of Death Valley. The original cut of Greed was between 8 and 9 hours long with two different subplots playing in the background, but was cut to 2 and a half despite Stroheim's protest. The original 8 hour reel is now lost, and only 12 people in total have seen it, making the original the ultimate holy grail for film enthusiasts. Those 12 people went so far as to proclaim that it was the greatest movie they had ever seen. And today, it's actually considered to be one of the greatest films ever made since it ended up heavily influencing movies to come throughout the years. It features bizarre themes and symbolisms that one would have to really study the film to find, including Darwin's theory of higher states of human beings, Greek tragedy, animal behavior, and the grotesque, as well as Christianity and human nature as a whole. The Monster of Frankenstein, 1920. Monstro di Frankenstein, or The Monster of Frankenstein, is a 1920 Italian silent film adaptation of Mary Shelley's classic novel. Frankenstein, directed by Eugenio Testa. Noted as one of the few Italian horror movies made before the 50s, the film struggled through censorship issues and underwent many recuts before being screened, the final cut rumored to be just 39 minutes long. Although primarily filmed in Italy, the feature did receive some German fundings. The movie was a massive box office hit and was screened worldwide, 
going as far as Belgium and Egypt. A French version of the film was even made, under the same title, but in French of course. Not to mention that it was still being showed six years after its debut premiere. The film is now sadly lost, with only some posters, pamphlets, and one single production still as its few remains. The First Man in the Moon, 1964 This black and white film is based on the science fiction novel of the same name and was produced in 1919 by H.G. Wells. Unlike the novel, it involves a romantic subplot and molds a prominent side character into the main antagonist. It was directed by Bruce Gordon and G.L.V. Lay, and the only record of this film is stills, and one description of the plot from the Bioscope Trade Paper of 1919, which reads, In the company of Rupert Bedford, a grasping spectacular, Samson Cavour, an elderly inventor scientist, ascends to the moon in a sphere coated with caverite, a substance which has the property of neutralizing the law of gravity. After strange adventures with the Selenites, the inhabitants of the moon, Bedford, villainously, deserts the professor and returns to the earth alone in order to make a fortune for himself out of Cavorite. By means of wireless telegraphy, however, Hogben, a young engineer in love with Caver's niece, Susan, succeeds in getting in touch with the stranded inventor, who denounces Bedford and states that he has been amicably received by the Grand Lunar, overlord of the Selenites. Susan, thereupon, indignantly rejects the proposals of Bedford, who has represented it as Cavor's last wish that she should marry him, and instead accepts Hogben as her husband. Upon its release, The First Men in the Moon received mixed reviews with critics noting the crude nature of its visual effects, but praising its loyalty to the original novel's vision despite its low budget. The film is now recorded in any archive and remains as one of British Film Institute's 75 Most Wanted Features. The film has even been credited by Robert Godwin as the first movie to ever be based entirely on a famous science fiction novel. The Gura Ghost Mystery, 1921 Influenced by the stone-throwing spirit Agura, South Wales, The Gura Ghost Mystery is a lost Australian film directed by John Cosgrove, who stars in it as well. The real-life story states that an innocent family in a Welsh town were plagued one day by banging on their walls and stones being thrown at their house's windows. The events of the film are almost identical to the real-life occurrences. What ends up happening is that one of the family's children admits to throwing the rocks at the house. However, she is deemed a not a viable suspect. Despite this, whenever the daughter was out of the house, there was no attacks. Sadly, little information is known about the film, and it's truly lost. What we know about the plot is only based off what actually happened in Gura. The movie itself is said to have done terribly in the box office, which is most likely why there is no existing copies of the film. Despite directing many films before, the Gura Ghost Mystery is the only film that John Cosgrove is legally credited for. And as a result of this film being lost, it means that his name is erased from history as well. Sadistic Bitch, 2002 Despite being made more recently than the other films on this list, Sadistic Bitch is completely lost. It was extremely hard finding any suitable information on it at all. What I find hilarious is that it was actually directed by the well-known Brad Jones, aka the cinema snob, who some of you probably know. For those who don't know, Jones reviews obscure films and exploitation pornography from the 1960s to the 1990s. Despite being quite famous, no one really knows that Jones directed a couple films himself. Not to mention that this one is almost identical to the films he most often critiques. No one actually knew of Sadistic Bitch until Jones mentioned it on his podcast, where he states that Sadistic Bitch features shit-eating and face-pissing. Sadistic Bitch is basically your average revenge torture porn. 
a woman finds out her husband is cheating on her, so she decides to document her revenge upon him, which entails her giving him a torturous sex change through gruesome methods that include tolls like power drills and tongs. An extremely graphic film, Sadistic Bitch was sadly among the stolen DVDs from Jones's gigantic collection. Because it was never aired online, unlike his other independent films, the likelihood of the film resurfacing is next to nothing. Zombie Hunger and Zombie Hunger 2, 1984 Amidst the New York filming subculture known as No Wave Cinema throughout the 70s and 80s, filmmaker and photographer Richard Kern is one of the most memorable names of the industry. Like many other films during this movement, Kern's short films were widely known to be bizarre yet unique, and heavily feature sex and violence. While many of his films are available on VHS or even on DVD, a set of two short films have been lost. Zombie Hunger, and its sequel, Zombie Hunger 2. Other than that, Kern directed them in 1984, and there is almost no information on these films. This perhaps makes the two some of Kern's earliest works. The plot of these two films are heavily debated among lost movie fanatics. Movie.com's description of the original Zombie Hunger was allegedly taken from a PDF on Kern's website, and it states that the movie is just a group of drug addicts shooting up heroin, and then vomiting profusely. The website even provides what's said to be a shot from the film. However, that has never been proven. Another alleged plot shows a man going on a violent rampage and smashing up his apartment, however leaving the cameraman unharmed. No sources claim to know the plot of Zombie Hunger 2. Nothing else about these movies has resurfaced, and most likely never will leaving them truly lost forever. The Cat Creeps 1930 Originally released in the 1930s, The Cat Creeps is one of the first sound horror films produced by Universal Pictures and directed by Rupert Julian and John Willard. A crime mystery drama, The Cat Creeps is actually a remake of The Cat and Canary, 1927, also by Universal Films. But this time, it will have the added benefit of having sound. It was shot in both English and Spanish, titled La Voluntad de Muerto, in Spanish, which translates into The Will of the Dead. All the movie is really about is strange disappearances and creepy happenings in a spooky old mansion in which the protagonists are residing in. Both the English and Spanish versions of The Cat Creeps are lost in their entirety, with only the soundtrack and official trailer as well as stills and a couple of clips remaining. The only reason why we have those clips is because of the 1932 comedy short film called Boo which was a show that made fun of different horror films using their own footage. The movie was remade by Universal in 1946, however, that is a loss as well. A seemingly interesting classic horror film, it's sad that it's now completely lost. Cruel Ghost Legend, 1968 with only a plot synopsis and two posters to go off of, Kazuo Hase's Cruel Ghost Legend is a lost Japanese horror film. Like other Japanese horror films from its time, Cruel Ghost Legend is artistic, surreal, and well-made. It's about a samurai and his family, and the curse put upon them after the samurai kills a blind masseur who asks him to repay debt. The curse brings many bloody deaths, incest, ghosts, and suicide to the family of the samurai and the daughters of the blind masseur. An eerie and uncomfortable atmosphere is portrayed throughout the film, leaving the viewer on the edge of their seat 24-7. Constant close-ups of the actors also gives viewers a sense of claustrophobia, adding to the horror aspect of the film. At the time Cruel Ghost Legend was filmed, 
ultra gory horror movies were being mass produced in Japan, which perhaps is why barely any surviving copies of this movie exist. It was simply overshadowed by other films at the time, however these are lost as well. At one point, an original second-hand VHS copy was being sold on Amazon.com for 15,000 Japanese yen, equal to about 122 US dollars. However, the original film is now available on YouTube, although in Japanese and without subtitles in any other language. Four Devils, 1928 one of the most famous lost silent drama films, Four Devils, is one of the most sought after lost films in movie history. Most of what is known about it is featured on a DVD made by Fox as part of their 20th Century Fox Studio Classics collection. Directed by F.W. Muirnay, Four Devils is a tragedy that focuses on four orphans being raised by an aged clown. Kinda creepy if you ask me. As adults, they form a trapeze artist troupe. However, that goes wrong when the oldest sibling falls for a wealthy woman, threatening to break the group apart. It ends with the second eldest sister falling from a trapeze stand with no net, but surviving, and then reconciling with the brother who fell in love with the wealthy woman. The film is based on the German novel Fire Devils, an eccentric novel. An earlier adaptation of this book was made in 1911, however, absolutely nothing is known about that one except that it simply existed. Four different endings for the film were shot by Mirne. In the first showing, both the brother and the sister died during the performance fall. Despite an audience poll proclaiming the movie being somewhat decent despite its tragic ending, Fox reshot and screened a new version with a happier ending. In 1937, tragedy struck. When a massive fire destroyed every single camera involved with the movie, because of horrible reviews, no copies were made prior to this. There's one myth that states that lead actress Mary Duncan threw the only existing copy into the ocean due to public criticism to her performance. However, this rumor has never been verified. Every time it hit the box offices, Four Devils did terribly and thus it gained no widespread attention. It did, however, receive a later adaptation with the original screenplay being narrated out loud. However, neither that nor the silent version has survived. The Merchant of Venice, 1969 This made-for-TV short is not entirely lost, only partially, but nonetheless, its story needs to be told. The Merchant of Venice was a short TV special directed by the famous Orson Welles, which starred him as well. The story itself was adapted from William Shakespeare's original play the same name. However, this adaptation solely focuses on the main antagonist, Shylock, in order to save on time and make the process of covering what they wanted to cover from the original play a lot easier which was the themes of anti-semitism, greed, and humanity. The project itself was filmed in 1969 in Italy and Yugoslavia as a compilation project called Orson's Bag. However, the, as the project came close to completion, CBS withdrew their funding due to Orson Welles' tax disputes with the United States. This led to further issues and eventually, the film was not even shown on television and thus lost, since no copies were made. Three out of the planned four work reels had been shot, however, the first and third of the work prints were stolen, leaving only the audio list original negatives. Until 2015, the only surviving material that was possible to see was a few clips from the second reel which were included on the documentary Orson Welles' The One Man Band. The film has now been restored by the Munich Film Museum. Starting with the complete first two reels as discovered, then using audio from a 1939 radio broadcast by Welles digitally synced to the third reel, 
for the missing four reel. The audio from 1939 is used over a photo still of Wells. The final time is only about 36 minutes. Cannibal Holocaust Unfinished Piranha Scene, 1980 Bringing about an insane amount of controversy with its release, Cannibal Holocaust is a cult classic Italian film for horror movie fans. Being the ultimate cannibal exploitation horror film, just about every slasher enthusiast knows of it. The main storyline is that a documentary film crew goes missing after being sent to the Amazon to study and document cannibalistic native tribes. An anthropologist is then sent to the jungle to find the crew, but only finds the tribe, their remains, and a video camera with horrifying content on it. Cannibal Holocaust has been known to scare even the most resilient of horror fans due to its found footage type of approach and its intense cannibalistic gore, animal cruelty, and sexual violence. Director Rogero Diodato was even investigated by Italian police for creating a snuff film, and he had to produce his quite alive actors during the search. While seemingly complete, Cannibal Holocaust actually has an unfinished scene that was considered to be lost, the infamous piranha scene. Deodato desperately wanted a scene towards the beginning of the film in which the natives fed a man from an enemy tribe to vicious piranhas. Sadly, he did not have an adequate underwater camera, not to mention that he could not train the piranhas, and so the scene was never finished. Only a couple of production stills remain from what was filmed of the piranha scene. No one knows where the surviving reels of the footage are, and they have yet to resurface. Number 13, 1922. When it comes to thriller films, the name Alfred Hitchcock is probably the most well known. Despite this, in 1922, Gainsborough Pictures allowed Hitchcock to direct his first film, which should have been his big break. Sadly, Hitchcock's number 13, alternately titled Mr. Peabody, is now lost. The film itself was just about the daily lives of the poor residents of the tenement building in London, run by the wealthy Peabody Trust to help impoverished Londoners. The only actors known to be in the movie are Claire Green and Ernest Thesiger. After just two reels being shot, the movie production had to be ceased due to its budget falling apart, resulting in said reels most likely being thrown in the trash. Hitchcock himself barely even acknowledged number 13, except when he was interviewed specifically about his beginnings as a director in the 1920s. He even allegedly stated that it, quote unquote, wasn't very good. People all over the world are still desperately searching for anything that remained from number 13, but only a single photo of the movie set has been made available. Blood Circus, 1985. Have you ever heard of the horror, science fiction, pro wrestling genre? Well, instead of being promoted through regular trailers, Blood Circus was instead promoted through late night infomercials. Director and producer Santonio Victor Raguzzo advertised his movie through his mail order jewelry business, Santano Gold. The entire plot of Blood Circus is not really well known, but I certainly know that it has absolutely nothing to do with jewelry. From what film enthusiasts have gathered, it's your classic alien invasion movie. However, these aliens are from the planet Zoran and are sent to only fight American and Soviet professional wrestlers. The highlight of this movie seems to be when Raguzzo, playing the character of Santano Gold, sings a song about the real life Santano Gold jewelry advertising his own business before the aliens and pro wrestlers brawl. Right 
Ragusa spent two years editing the film, but never found anyone to distribute it, which means he had to settle with only showing it at a few private cinemas in the Baltimore area over the course of a week. Blood Circus had a budget of $2 million, but made nowhere near that in the box office or at the screenings. Screen bags were given to the audience members. The screen bags had a poem about Blood Circus printed on it, and also contained a coupon for a free diamond ring from, you guessed it, Santana Gold. Since 1987, Blood Circus wasn't seen again until 2008. That's when a copy of the film was discovered by Santano Gold Company themselves. Santano Gold immediately requested producers to come forward and create a official release. Sadly, once again, no producers or distributors signed up and Santano Gold attempted to sell the original reels on eBay for over 21 million US dollars. Not one sole bid on the item remained and so the auction was taken down, but then put back up in 2013 only to have no one buy it once again. Since then, the auction has not been relisted. And all we have to remember this masterpiece is the infamous Santana Gold infomercial. Cards of Death, 1986 Japanese VHS release. Widely considered a holy grail to film enthusiasts, W.G. McMillan's Cards of Death is a true rarity among hunters for lost films. Shot in California in 1985, this extremely low-budget film was never released in the States, but did get released on VHS solely in Japan in 1986 and in very limited quantities. Cards of Death was most likely only released in Japan because of its over-excessive gore. The film features a cult-like community in Los Angeles led by a strange man who goes by the name of Hog. When the group meets up, the men wear rubber masks and the women wear BDSM-esque black leather lingerie and a deck of tarot cards are handed out to the members and a game similar to poker ensues. The person with the death card at the end is the loser and that unfortunate soul must be killed by the winner in an extremely sadistic, painful way within 24 hours of the initial game. One example of these deaths is a woman being crushed in what is known as a shrinking room. During all this, police attempt to interfere with the cult's practices. Critics at the time called the actors subpar and the camera work shaky and unprofessional. Despite this, film lovers continued to seek out Cards of Death, most likely because of its notoriety for being messed up and gory as hell, and for being lost, of course. Obvious elements of the film include rape, masochism, and drug use. Notable scenes include two naked female lovers making out next to a corpse after having drank its blood from a wine glass and a police officer getting his nose cut off with a deli cheese slicer at the beginning of the movie. Only a couple of the original Japanese VHS tapes are known to exist today, which are all owned by film collectors and critics. Said copies have been thoroughly reviewed and analyzed, yet no copies of the tapes have been released as of yet. A limited edition VHS version of the film was released in the United States in 2014, 28 years after the movie was taken off Japanese shelves. The Golem and The Dancing Girl, 1917 The Golem and the Dancing Girl is a German film from 1917 and is labeled as a comedy due to it being a parody of its predecessor, The Golem, 1915. It is the second movie in the trilogy, preceded by the aforementioned The Golem, and The Golem, How He Came Into the World, 1920. Next to nothing is known about the film, except that it was written and co-directed by Paul Wegner, who also starred in it himself. Not even the plot of this movie is known. All we truly know is that Wegner dressed up as the character of The Golem as a joke, 
only to have slapstick complications occur as a result. At the time of filming, the Nazi party had just taken power in Germany. Assuming that the golem in this film is the golem from Jewish folklore, this could have been very early anti-Semitic propaganda, however, there is no proof. The film is now completely lost, and the only evidence of its existence is the cast list, a poster, and one photograph. The Deep, 1970 Orson Welles is one of the most prominent figures in film history. He created one of the greatest films of all time, Citizen Kane, and threw the country into mass hysteria over his famous radio broadcast, War of the Worlds, which tricked a lot of gullible Americans into thinking that we are being attacked by large alien structures and that we are pretty much screwed. It threw a lot of people into a hysteria, and newspapers all over printed about this crazy alien outbreak, only to be made a fool of when there were absolutely no aliens. Either way, Orson Welles is a prominent figure within the horror community, as well as film in general, and this is why The Deep is such a lost treasure. The Deep was originally a part of a film compilation called Orson's Bag, which was to be shown on live television. Like the aforementioned Merchant of Venice, like I said before, after tax disputes with the United States, CBS withdrew their funding for Orson Welles' films, and the films were not able to be aired. The Deep, also titled Dead Reckoning, was mostly shot between 1966 and 1969, but was continuously reshot with added scenes up until 1973. It is based off a thriller novel, simply known as Dead Claim, by Charles Williams. The film, like the novel, is a thriller about a newlywed couple who takes a sailing trip on their yacht and then finds a stranded boat with one lone man inside. The man claims to be the only survivor of some sort of tragedy that occurred before the movie's events. However, checking below the ship, the husband discovers a man alive below this deck. That's when he sees the previous stranger grab his wife and attempt to rush to the yacht. And then, that's it. There is no more movie. That, that is the entire movie. Despite not having much of an ending, it took an insanely long time to film. While shooting on the coast of Yugoslavia, the cast and crew encountered a plethora of problems, such as bad weather and even one of the actors leaving the set. Not to mention, Wells was always running out of money and could only shoot when he actually had money. Finally, the lead actor, Lawrence Harvey, ended up dying, which caused Wells to cease filming. This officially left the entire production forgotten about, because the original negative of the movie has been lost, and its only remains being two work prints and a trailer, The Deep is officially a lost film. Although there are plans to finish the film with inner titles filling the missing scenes, no action has been taken to do so. Today, along with The Merchant of Venice and more of Wells' unfinished works, The Deep was featured at the Museum of Modern Art at a temporary exhibit titled The Unknown Orson Welles in Winter of 2015. Mickey Mouse in Vietnam 1968. In the midst of the Vietnam War, a silent animated Mickey Mouse short film was produced in protest of the bloodshed. Unlike these other films mentioned, it's no longer lost, however, it was rumored to be lost for quite a while. The running time is just over one minute, and it features a happy-go-lucky Mickey Mouse signing up for the Vietnam War. He travels to Vietnam, but is immediately shot. Just seconds after his arrival, the final moments of the shot showing a dead Mickey with a bullet to the head. The film faded into obscurity and remained forgotten for decades. In 2010, the film reappeared in the Sarajevo Film Festival. It was revealed to be in the possession of the filmmaker's co-op in New York, as the collection reel titled 
for life against the war selections. The reel was available for rent, but strictly only for relevant organizations, making it difficult to get a hold of. In 2013, a YouTuber named Abad Higgins uploaded the short online. In a later interview with Abad Higgins, it was revealed that he supposedly discovered the film in a scrap film bin, most likely saving it from complete destruction. Director Lee Savage and co-creator Milton Glaser made it in protest against the Vietnam War, which was going on at the time. Glasser said in an interview, It was for a thing called the Angry Arts Festival, which was kind of a protest event, inviting artists to produce something to represent their concerns about the war in Vietnam, and a desire to end it. There is a rumor that Disney itself attempted to destroy all copies of the film, even though Savage and Glasser only showed it to their close friends. This rumor is considered false, but is still something interesting to think about. Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the end of the video. I just want to quickly inform you that this video would have been impossible without the contributions made by the Lost Media Wiki. Seriously, those guys put in so much effort into preserving these films that I really think you should actually check out the wiki yourself. And if you happen to have a few bucks lying around, you can make these videos more possible by sending a quick donation to their Patreon. I'll have that linked in the description below if you want to check it out. In the meantime, if you're looking for more videos like mine, I would highly recommend you check out my buddy Blame It On George channel. Actually, I recently was narrating in a list of his called 11 Insane Knockoffs of Children's Shows. This video is actually annotated on screen right now, so you can simply take a look at it and go right to it. Trust me, Blame It On George makes some amazing content, and if it wasn't for his editing help, this video also wouldn't be possible. So, do him a solid, let him know I sent ya. In the meantime, expect new videos to be out soon. I've been your host at Creepy Reading, and today I'm signing off.